Next week there won't be a share because I'm leaving for Israel. And we'll continue after Purim. Uh, what I want to do is tonight, um, which I, I don't think I ever really gave a share, but uh, uh, this week is a sort of a tebes. So I, I thought it would be interesting to give a share about a sort of a tebes. Because really it's a very, uh, it's a very interesting fast day, a sort of a tebes. So I thought uh, covered a sort of a tebes to speak about a sort of a tebes. Is that all? So Abitavis really uh, is very interesting, it's, which is interesting, it comes out on January 1st, which is Thursday. That's when Mamish comes out, which, uh, as you'll see, is in a certain sense very uh, appropriate, as we will see, you know. <coughs> January 1st. A sort of Abitavis, well, first thing is, of course, is we know it's a fast day, obviously, you know. It's one of the Tanisim that the... Uh, Chazal established, and so on. You know, so Tevis, and you have Tiny Sesta, you have Shivas of Thomas, and you have Tishabov, and so on. Those are major Tanisim. <coughs> <coughs> so the question, of course, is uh, what, what, what historical event occurred on a Serb Tevis? You know, that's the first question you have to ask. Because every, every fast day has a historical event. So the question what is, <clears throat> what is the historical event that occurred on a Sorba Tevez? <coughs> Tevez, and so on. And the answer to that is that Nebuchadnezzar began his siege of Jerusalem, Yushalayim. That it began. That was the beginning, sort of the end. The end, of course, became when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the base of Migdash, the first base of Migdash, the first temple. That was obviously the end. What's interesting is that Asur B'tavis actually happened a couple of years before the destruction of the first place of Mikdash. We're not looking here that it happened and then all of a sudden on Tisha B'av, uh, the base of Mikdash was destroyed. Actually it was a couple of years before it <coughs> took siege and then whatever. Uh, and then a couple of years later it destroyed the base of Mikdash. That's obviously what happened. Anyway, so what Chazal saw is that they decided to... Um, uh, to make a sorbet as a fast day because of that. So that's the historical event that occurred. A sorbet obviously is, uh, is not your average fast day. It doesn't have the same halachas in many ways, or certain ways actually, uh, as uh, other fast days, and that's something to look at. And also, obviously, to really analyze what exactly is the significance in Hashkofa of Asur B'tevis, to try to explain why. And in many ways, as you'll see, the idea is really, the Hashkof of it is very startling. It also happens to be the shortest fast day, by the way, you know, uh, of, the, of the year, because it occurs, I think, uh, I think 6.08, the fast begins in the morning. So if you get up earlier, you can eat some. And it ends 5.29, which is like unheard of, you know. It's just around dinner time, you know, just just perfect for dinner time, you know. Not like Tisha B'Av, which is over at 9.30 some of the day, you know. But Asar uh, B'Teves is the shortest fast day. But what is interesting about Asar B'Teves is some of the, the uh, halachas of it. The first idea is that Asar B'Teves is the only fast day that if it falls on Friday, which doesn't come out too many times, you have to fast. Your mamish has to fast on Friday if a sorbet tevis falls out on Friday, <clears throat> which doesn't happen that often. I think the next time it will happen, if I'm right, is 2018. It's like four years from now. But when it does fall out on Friday, Erev Shabbos, you need to fast. Now that's a tremendous chiddush because that halacha does not exist by any other fast day, any other tainus. And what is interesting about that is that you need to fast until Tzay Saikachov, literally, right up to Shabbos, which in many ways, that means you come into Shabbos starving. And that is not covered Shabbos. So the, the priests can give different aids, you know, they say, well, what you're supposed to do is daven Shabbos early, early, and so on. 
<coughs> and then when you daven Shabbos early, <coughs> then you have the suda, because once you have Shabbos, so then you can have a suda, and the suda, but you don't have the suda before. What you do is, as soon as seis happens, you're ready for kiddush. You know, which is interesting. You know, so you makabel Shabbos earlier, and together with uh, Shabbos, the empty of Shabbos, which is seis, you make kiddush. But really, it's an astonishing halacha, because essentially you're really entering Shabbos, starving, which is not covered Shabbos. So that is the first highly unusual thing about Asarba Davis. <coughs> what it does tell us, obviously, is that if Asarba Davis, you, you fast Mamish on Friday, Mamish until Tzais, then Asarba Davis is a very important fast. <coughs> And it has in incredible historical significance, although we have to understand what. Why is it different than Tishabov? Right? You know, Tishabov, okay, uh, uh, which we'll see. But um, why? Just because he started the siege of Jerusalem? So, therefore, what? Okay, it ended a couple of years later with Tishabov. So, why is it so severe that if it happens on Shabbos, you are just supposed to fast? No, Shabbos. <coughs> yeah. yeah. But if you think that's incredible, it says in Yechezkel that Be'etzim Hayyim Hazer, that's the Lushman, the Nevucha Netza laid siege to Jerusalem. It's in Yechezkel, you know. <coughs> so there's a Rishon, an Avodrom, there's a Rishon, that says that if Asur Betebes fell out on Shabbos, which it doesn't and it can't, by the way, but theoretically, if it falls out on Shabbos, you have to fast on Shabbos. You know, that is unbelievable. And the Puskim, the Shukhan I mean, you know, I say, like, where did he get this from? Like, how's that possible? Even Tishbov, which obviously is the actual destruction, is a Nitcher. They're all Nitcher. If they come out on Shabbos, what happens? Then they get moved, whatever, earlier, later, whatever, but they certainly never, it never happens on Shabbos. Yet, as Surah Batavis, according to the Advavadrom, if it fell out on Shabbos, you'd have to fast. Now, the truth is, it doesn't fall out on Shabbos. Because Rosh Chodesh Tevez can never fall out on a Thursday. So therefore, Asura B'Tevez, right, which would have fallen out on a Shabbos, had Rosh Chodesh Tevez fallen out on Thursday, will also never happen, because Rosh Chodesh Tevez can never be on a Thursday. So the mice it doesn't happen that way. <clears throat> but the, the Chiddush of the Avadrom is incredible. Now he gets it. Where does he get it from? You know, well, obviously because it says in Yecheskel, Be'etzim Hayyim Hazer, on this very day. And whenever it says Be'etzim Hayyim Hazer, that's it. You know what I'm saying? That supersedes everything. So that's where he gets it from. So his reasoning is, is that when Chazal did make a tainus because of our Surah tables, right? It's got to be no matter what day this date falls out on. So even if it falls out on Shabbos, you would have to have fast on Shabbos, which is really astounding when you think about that. You know, it's like it's hard enough to believe that Friday, and you walk into Shabbos starving, how much more so that it's Doichas Shabbos itself. And it's only Midrash Bonin, we're not talking about a Diraisa. The only fast day that does what? That can supersede Shabbos is Yom Kippur, right? That's the only one. Okay, that's Menat Torah. You know, what the Barsham says, this comes first. But uh, a, a, a rabbinically ordained fast day should also have that prayer. You know, so the post come like I wonder over the other drum. Now the Psak is obviously not that way, because obviously it never falls that way. But they wonder where he got this from, or how he got this, you know. But we know anyway, even without that, you need to fast on Friday which itself is an incredible Chiddush. Everybody made that you have to fast on Friday. So the question is, what's going on here? You know what I'm saying? So obviously it tells us something, that there's something about Asar B'Tebes that is unique, different than all the other fast days. First question. Second interesting point about Asar B'Tebes is that, wait a minute, he laid siege to Jerusalem on a Serbatavis, Nebuchadnezzar. 
The Beis Hamikdash wasn't destroyed until several years later. So the, why do this on Sabbath uh, You know what I'm saying? That's the question. Wait. Well, we did wait. That's why you have Tisha B'Av, right? You have Tisha B'Av and so on because of the destruction itself. You know, both Beis Hamikdashes and so on. Both temples were destroyed. But why do you start a fast day a couple of years before when it was the beginning? Obviously, if you capture Jerusalem, that's the beginning in a certain sense of the end. Because then he's got control over Yerushalayim. And okay, you know, if the Jews don't shape up, whatever, which obviously they didn't, then he takes over. But it didn't happen then. So why start a fast day on something which there was no Choban in and of itself? That is a very powerful question. Now we do see some type of resemblance to that because we know that on Tisha B'av, the 9th of Av, the Beis Hamikdash was not destroyed. The burning started really toward the end of Tisha B'av, but the building burned down or whatever was destroyed on the 10th of Av. But Chazal decided to make the fast day on the 9th of Av, not the 10th. You know, which itself is interesting. Why? Why not make it on the day it burned down? Well, it's true that the burning started on the 9th, but the thing really burned down on the 10th. But you also have other reasons for Tisha B'av. What? Yeah. Yeah, other reasons. You have Nishchak, Ruchah is... No. Uh, no, that's Shivas yeah. and Thomas. Shivas and Thomas, I'm sorry. But you, you also do have other reasons. For yeah, you have a couple. One of them was, uh, well, two of them in the base of Middash. Then you have Beit Tal's destroyed. Beit Tal, then you have uh, Apostimus, Sarah Apostimus, etc. Who's that? Um, no, uh, the um, Harisha of the Hech of the Hech. Yeah, Spain. they plow Jerusalem the like a field. Right. The Mokka Middash. Right. Yeah, okay, fine. But it's not different uh, than the Chobim itself. You know? I mean, Chobim is really the thing that we do, you know? Okay, Beitah was destroyed, which is terrible, you know? And uh, what he called, uh, and they plowed it like a field. And of course, the Miraglam. That, right, that's, right. the, that's how the first one, right? Yes. But, uh, okay, you know? But uh, what we're, what the commemoration isn't for the Miraglam. You know what I'm saying? Even though these things occurred on that day, but that's not why we do it. We do it because the Bai Srishan and the Bai Shani were destroyed. You know what I'm saying? And they were destroyed on the tenth of Av. So why do we do that? Why should we begin the fast from the day earlier? But I can hear that better than a Sarbatavis, which is a couple of years before. You know what I'm saying? So those are two very uh, interesting points um, that tell us that there's something about our Sarbatavis. You know, that really dem demands uh, a real uh, treatment of, you know, really think about that and so on, you know. So that's uh, these two questions and so on, you know. <coughs> so why Friday? And why something so far in advance of the base of Midas actual destruction? Those are two fundamental questions. Uh, okay. The reason for that is a, really a very interesting reason. I once spoke. I once brought this Gemara down, um, but I, and, I, and I spoke about it because this Gemara is a tremendous premius, and in many ways, it answers why it answers these two fundamental questions. And it's Apiyah Shkof, it's a very important concept. There's a Gemara Brochus, which is that Gimel Omen Aleph. Anyway, somebody... We have Omar Rav Yitzhak by Shmuel Mishmei de Rav. So Rav Yitzhak by Shmuel said in the name of Rav. That Gimel Mishmuel is Hevra Laila. That the night is divided into three periods of time. They're called watches, but three periods of time. They are called Mishmuel and Mishmuel. And on each one of these, 
Yeshiv HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Baruch Hashem sits, V'shoi Kari, and he roars like a lion. Roaring like a lion is obviously uh, an indication of a lot of pain, you know, or a tremendous anguish, you know. V'oimeh, what did the Baruch say? Oy lebonim she'abe avonah sehem, woe is to the children, that because of their sins, hechrafti is basi, I destroyed my house. Visarafti is hecholi, I burnt my temple. Viheglisim lebein umas oilam, and I exiled my people amongst the goyim. Okay, so there are three things. So the fact that the Moshe Meshoy Kwari roars like a lion, okay, uh, as I said, one idea is that clearly this indicates Kaviyoho of an enormous amount of anguish and agony. Because we're talking about roaring like a lion. Okay. The second idea we could talk about ro roaring like a lion is because what is a lion really? It's a symbol of Yehuda. Right? <coughs> it's a symbol of Mashiach and David. Malchus. Right? And we know that a symbol of Yehuda is a lion. Right? So the lion roars, the Russian roars, uh, roars in anguish that the Malchus of Beis David will not occur, not for a long time. <clears throat> you see, it's like, a, it's like somebody who should have been king, he's not king, so what's he going to express? Tremendous anguish that he cannot be appointed king, which in our sense means that Mashiach <coughs> won't come. Okay? And when he says here, uh, that he says that woe is to the children that because of their sins, that's exclusively what it is. <clears throat> Which means that they are, let's see, but anyway, I destroyed my house, which is what? It's amigdash. It's amigdash, right? Then Sarafti is Hecholi, I destroyed the Hechol, right? And the Hechol is what? The Hechol is Pnimi, yes? And I exiled my nation among the world. So really, what, what, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that's what it says. So that's Rav Shmuel, Rav Yitzhak Bar Shmuel, Mishmei to Rav. Then we have a Brisa that says Rav Yossi, once he went into a Churva, right, one of the Churvas of Yishlayim to be Psalm, then Elio Novi met him. Uh, he was wait, actually was wait, he was waiting by the door until Rav Yossi finished Monesre. Imagine just waiting at the door for Rav Yossi, you know. Usually, uh, most people waiting at the door is your wife telling you to come home because uh, I just made supper or something like that, right? But anyway, uh, and he said, so after I finished my tefillah, so uh, he said to me, Shalom Alecha Rebbe, interesting. He called Rabbi Yossi Rebbe. Uh, and I said to him, Shalom Alecha Rebbe, and Moiri, you know, and so on. Because, uh, okay. So he says, uh, why did you go into the Churva? And he says, uh, you shouldn't have gone, you should have been spoiled at Felix Sara. Certain halachas that come out of it. <clears throat> then he asked me, Eliyahu Novi asked him, Rabbi Yossi, he said to me, Bni, my son, Makol Shemat Bechuvazu. What voice did you hear? Because obviously Rabbi Yossi was a great man, especially since he's Zuchat the Gil Elio. So he asked him, What did you hear? So Omati Loi, so I said to him, Shomati Basko. I heard a Basko. Sheminahemis Kiyuno. That was That was Minahemis I think is cooing like a dove. We emeris, and it said the same thing. Oil Bonum Shabana Sam, woes to the children. That uh, because of their sins, the crafty is basi. I destroyed my house. The sarafti is hecholi, and I exiled my uh, and I I burned my echol. The eglisim the bein umus, and I ex and uh, I, uh, put, I exiled my uh, my children into, to the nations of the world. Yomali and Eliyahu said to me, Rabbi Yosi, Chayecho, by your life. By the life of your head, 
that this voice that you hear is not just a one-time occasion. In every day, three times every day, okay, that he says this. In any case, that the Bosham says this three times a day. Okay, this is what he said. Well, you can, uh, the question is, what is the Gemara really saying? What's the significance of this Gemara? You can also ask, well, I mean, why is it in the first time he was Shoyakari? He roared like a lion, which is obviously tremendous pain. And then here it's Menahemes Kiyoino, and here he cooed like a dove, which obviously is considerably less volume of noise. Or, or sound and so on and so forth. Clearly there's a tremendous distinction. Although the actual wording, what the Bosham did, is obviously the same. You know. <clears throat> so this Gemara is a very critical Gemara. Very. Because what the underlying concept here, the true premise of this, is that it indicated a tremendous change in the Anhoga of the Rebbeinu Shalom toward Kala Yisrael. That's really what it is. And there are several ideas to this. <clears throat> the first time Hoga is that he destroyed his, his uh, temple, which means he destroyed the, the Beis Amigdash, and it's Beisi, <coughs> right? Uh, what is Beisi? Beisi is the external, is the house. Until then, Christ will have an unbelievable relationship with the Marshall. You go to his house, he's there. That's where he resides or dwells. So a bias is what we can see, right? So a bit and so on, you know? So Bosham says that there is no longer an indication, even physically, of our relationship. It's gone. There is no house, you see. And that's a terrible, uh, a terrible, a terrible thing. That it, if you want to go, if you wanted to see the Rebbeinu in a certain sense, you went to the base of Mikdash in Yushalayim. You went to Eilu Regal, you went to Yushalayim, and you saw the Nisim. There were Nisim going on, miracles going on all the time in the base of Migdash. What a place to get Chizuk. What a place to daven. Imagine davening. I'm sure there were shuls right around, you know, Svad, Ashkenaz, Yemenite, all minyan, you know, all the kinds of minyan, right? I can you imagine davening a, a, an Armenian right next to the base of Migdash? Beyond belief, right? <laughs> and then there was the Kedusha that you felt. You know, as you walk closer to the base of Mikdash, the feeling that you must have felt was beyond belief. So you had the miracles there all the time for Chizik and Muna. Then the feeling just being there was incredible. Then the davening right around there, right, was absolutely incredible. <clears throat> so therefore, as far as Jews are concerned, it's gone. It's no longer. All those incredible uh, opportunities is gone. What a horror. So that's the first thing. Basi, my visible relationship with you is gone. But then it says, Sarafti is Hechali. I burnt down my Hechal. <coughs> okay. What's that? What is the burning down of Hechal? That's not just the outer guise, the outer form, the house, but burnt the Hechal is the Pimius. I take back my Nevoa. That's the end of prophecy. You see. And Nevoa is my connection to Barshalom internally. Pneumius. The Nishama. That now even the Gedolim don't feel the Barshalom. Prophecy in Nevoa was the greatest connection or attachment that you can have with the Barshalom. It's unbelievable. Once went through what Nevoa is and so on. <clears throat> but the essence of Nevoa really wasn't to be a prophet where you can tell people what it will be. The essence of the Nevoa is that it was a relationship that you could communicate with the Barnashla. And with that communication, you learned a great deal of information, obviously incredibly esoteric and Kabbalistic information. And you had an incredible sense of vacuous. We don't even know what Navi was. We do not know. It's the greatest spiritual state that has ever been given to man, is prophecy. But not because of a fortune telling. It's not prophecy. 
the real concept of prophecy and why that's why were there millions of prophets in Kalei Israel was to have a connection with the Barashlam, Dvekas, which is an unbelievable <coughs> spiritual enlightenment and height, right? Uh, so, and also the communications, you know, besides the telling the future and so on. And, and like I said, the feelings at Vegas, that was the real reason for Nevoah, because it was the greatest spiritual experience that a person can have. So that's Sarafti Yasei I burnt down my Hechol, I burnt down the relationship that you have with me, Pneumius. What is that? That's Rihuk. That means the Barashim removed himself both externally and internally from the Jew. Kaviyochu. Not that he really literally did that, but he certainly removed all the tangible connection that we have. Of course the Barashim is still there and so on, but the tangible connections we have with him is gone. That's the concept of Rihuk. So there's no external relationship that we can actually be part of. There's no internal relationship. There's no nevuah. There's no prophecy anymore, which is the greatest connection that you can have to Barashlam. So if that's not bad enough, throw them out. Send them to the Goyim. Because what the Barashlam could have said is, hey, you're in Eretz Yisrael, and I'm gone. But at least you can live in Eretz Yisrael, right? But once he was, he was exiled them to the Umar Sa'ilam, what that meant is that the Umar Sa'ilam, the nations of the world, now have shlita over them, control, so they can now harm you, create enormous physical pain, right? They can bankrupt you. They can do anything they want to you, you see. But the worst thing that they can do for you is they can stop you from growing in Ruchnius, either forcibly or because of their crazy lifestyle of immorality. <clears throat> you know, I, 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 I remember I, I used to give a shit in Manhattan. I said, you have to be out of your mind to live in Manhattan. How you live in Manhattan, you know? You know, I mean, I, oh, people, you know, it's a, it's a nice it's night. It's coming. What? It's not coming. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, the truth, it's, it's, it's all about America, but Manhattan is like, you know, it, it's like the intense essence of America. All the gashmias, all the zimo, all the immorality, all the chemnes hamaman, all the drive for cash, for money, Wall Street. It's like, it's got everything you want, which is part of Edom. It's Edom's capital city. That's what it is. So I said, how can, you, how can you be any ruchni there? You can't. You forget about it. You walk out in the street, it's over with. You know? And then, you, you, and uh, you know, it's funny. I, I remember I, I used to give a shia in Manhattan quite a while ago. You know, I remember I used to go to that shia. And as soon as I drove into Manhattan, I could feel the tumor. You can just cut it with a knife. That's how bad it was, you know? It just, you know, I remember I once commented, I was walking on Fifth Avenue, somewhere on Fifth. 48th Street, whatever. So I looked up and said, it's incredible. I could just, it's like I'm immersed in a mikvah of tumor. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a mamish immersed in a tumor mikvah. You know? <clears throat> it, was, it, it was what's called palpable, tangible. That's how bad it was. But anyway, so I told him, how do you do that? So the goyim stop a Jew from being a yid, why, how? Even if he doesn't persecute you and punish you or, you know, and, and, and you know, forcibly force you to worship other gods and, and, you know, he just lives his lifestyle and you're into that lifestyle. You know, how do you get out of it? Uh, so those are the three terrible things that the Ramon Shalom has decreed for Kali Yisrael. Absolutely terrible. But there's one more. Yes? If there's an obvious answer to this, I apologize. Why then did you are forgiven retroactively? Why would it come now? What? Why would a carbono stop? Which carbono? The sacrifices. Well, because there's no base on English. Yeah, without that. There's no. Sure, you know. I mean, it wasn't just that. It's the Korban Tomit. You know, the Tomit that stopped on Shiva's with Thomas, you know. You know, no Tomit. The whole, the whole, what's called sacrificial you needed that physical uh, operation. Well, the mitzvah, you need the temple, you need the uh, the altar, and so on. You know, 
So that stopped. I think the Mashiach had lost his assignment to tell people after they came back from Manhattan to go to the mikvah. He told them to go to the mikvah. <laughs> Didn't help. <laughs> anyway, so that's what the Bosham did. That's what this Gemara. Now you could you could say, well, I'll answer that in a minute. But you know, but the truth is, it's a fourth terrible thing. It's not just that we lost our, or lost our outer connection with the Bosham. And we lost our inner connection, and now we're we're running, we're walking around in this tumor mikvah called, you know, the umas and so on. But there's something else which is terrible, and that is that, well, if the Russian recedes from us, why? What does it mean? It means clearly what the Russian says: I want to say them. They have sinned, and if they have sinned, I will what recede. Correct. But what it really also says is that, wait a minute. But what one says, if clients feel sins and they don't draw down the Kiddusha, what does that mean? Does that mean we don't get Kiddusha? No. It means that the Satan is unique from the Kiddusha that we should have drawn down because of our mitzvahs. Our mitzvahs. Words, when you do a sin, it's not merely, well, then the, the holiness will envelop you. No. It's that the Satan is Yonek, all of a sudden, he's Makatre, he prosecutes. Uh, and they decide that you're guilty, then he is able to take from your Kiddusha, your holiness that you would have gotten had you done the mitzvah. So therefore, you are empowering the Satan to do terrible things. That's called Tegbar Sara, the growth of evil. <clears throat> so that's the fourth idea, really. Of what happens, of what the, what, of what happened here, the zero, and so on. Uh, therefore, clearly, what you begin to understand, and I think I once illustrated, what does it mean that the sudden is unique? Maybe I one long time, but it's good I haven't mentioned since I'm just talking about this. Uh, Two thousand five hundred years ago, the base of Mikdash was destroyed. We know that, right? The first temple. But we also know that the Bansham left, because that's what it means. The question is, when the Bansham leaves, where does he go? Where does he go? And the answer is, not go anywhere. What the Bansham does is the Sutton comes over and obviously prosecutes Klein's role. And the Bansham says, okay, I will allow you to be unique, to derive nourishment or power from whatever they lack. And since what they lack is the Shekhinah, the divine presence, you will be able to unique for me. That means you, the trans, the, the, the power of the divine presence, the Shun itself, which goes to Klai Yisrael, since I now recede, which is called Rechok, I distance myself, that will now go to who? To the Sotan. So the Sotan is unique from the Shechina, from the divine presence itself. He derives sustenance or holiness from the divine presence itself. Which is astounding. Now, Abraham does that because that's Din, me, the connected meter, the certain Tainas. You know, uh, they don't want you, so I want you. The real question we have to ask is what does he want, Abraham? What does he want to do? Put on Talis and film in the morning? Like, what's the point, you know? Uh, he's not about to become a tzaddik. But he wants the power of the divine presence itself. Why? Because what he could do then is unusual. Klai was able to perceive the nature of God because they had a relationship with him. When the Satan is unique from the Kiddush of the Shekhinah, and by the way, that's what it means that the Bansham is in Golas. Shekhinah Bikolusa simply means that the Bansham is held captive voluntarily by a foreign power, the Satan, and the Satan is able to derive tremendous power from that capture, so to speak, of the Shekhinah. So therefore, in a certain sense, God is in, in, God is in Golos. Uh, but he voluntarily allows himself to be in Golos. Fine. Uh, so what does a Sutton do with this? And the answer is, he does the same concept of what Klai Yisrael has. Klai Yisrael had access to the Shekhinah, to prophecy, to the whole uh, you know, situation. Therefore, he now has access also to the Shekhinah, which means he can now give mankind a different belief system of God. You'll notice something very interesting, that at the same, at the same time we lost the Shekhinah, <clears throat> okay, the major religions of the world were founded. Buddhism, 
live then. Taoism, Lao Tzu, live then. Okay? And not only that, Confucius lived then. These are major religions in Asia. Not only in Asia, in the East, even in the West. In the West, what did you have? You had Western civilization, you had Greek, Greek philosophy. You had Aristotle, you had Socrates, Plato, you had Parmenides, Pythagoras. That was the beginning of Greek wisdom. And all of it started then. And not only that, but we also had Rome. Rome in 525 BCE became, a, became founded because they threw off the Etruscan rule and they became a major power and they said, well, that's when they were founded. Romulus and uh, uh, the, those two guys, whatever and so on. And, uh, but in any case, why all three? Because when we lost the Shekhinah, what did we lose? We lost Ferris and Oyes. We lost beauty, which is Chochmah, and might. The beauty we lost was the Chochmah Satera, the Pneumius and so on, and that was given to the Greeks as science, Chochmah, okay, and we also, we also lost not just first, but always might, and that's the establishment of Rome. Also the Chochmah of the West, of the, of the East and so on. So all of that happened at the same time that we lost the Beis Amigdash, that's our stuff. So that's also the tragedy. Mm. That when he says, and I exile them among the nations of the world, he's also saying, I exile them where? Among, not the nations of the world, but the nations, but I exile them among the Sultan. And the Shlichim, the messengers of the, of the Sultan, is the nations of the world. So that fourth tragedy is included in what? In the Umus Oilam, you see. And so that's the first idea. And that's what the Echo says, you know. He says there, you know, Soreo Makeo Bagoyim and Echo, Soreo Makeo, her Soreo, her princes, Makeo kings, Bagoyim, are exiled among the nations. This is Echo. Okay? What's that? That's might. Ain't Torah. There is no Torah. And what's that? Chokmo. And even the prophets don't see any vision. You see. So all of that went into what's called the Golos, or in Kabbalistic language, it went into the Klippa. Why didn't they get prophecy like, like Bilam or Rosh, or like some, the Nevoah went from Klai Yisrael to them, actually. Klai to who? To, to the Goyim. It didn't go. What, what, when the Russian recedes, no, when the Russian recedes, he receives from both sides. But you, you're just saying that he went to the, to, to the Goyim, he went to the Sitra, to the Sultan. No, he allowed the Sultan to be unique from him, but not prophecy. Shlita, Chochba, wisdom, and, uh, and Shlita means uh, uh, dominion. That's what went, first and noise, and so on. Okay? Uh, and the second incredible thing, you find the same thing. When the second base of this was destroyed, you know, what, what happened? Same idea. The Bolshem left, and that's what Rabbi Yossi is referring to here. You know, and so on, that he left, and therefore there was a tremendous distance, the same concept. The Samidish was destroyed, the external, the internal is Hecholim, and the Bein Umas Oilam was also that, right? And uh, of course, what does that mean? That the Sultan can be Yone, the Sultan can nourish from the Divine Presence, then also, which is 2,000 years ago, correct? And of course, what happens then? Then you have tremendous amount of Shlita by the Goyim, and that's where you talk about Christianity. Christianity was formulated or founded right around the time of the base of Migdash was destroyed and that was basically Zera. That's again the Sultan taking the Shechina, being able to uh, foist a new religion on the Umas Oilam and the Jews have been destroyed for 2,000 years because of that. In any case, so we see that there are really four tragedies. The destruction of the base of Migdash is one. That's the external opportunities to relate. The second is the premius. That's the end of prophecy. Okay? The third thing is being the umas oilam between the goyim. That encompasses two concepts. One is that they now have shlit of us to destroy our ruchnias. And the second thing is that the satan takes from the kedusha and gives to the goyim, which they, they use, of course, to destroy us. So we're really looking at four terrible tragedies all based on this Chazal, you see.
Now, the question is, so what happened here, really? This is the bad news. What really is going on? <clears throat> what it means, really, is that the tikkun of the Bria, the rectification of creation, no longer happens in a majority case of mitzvahs and tshuva. There are three ways to do the tikkun. Mitzvahs is one, you do mitzvahs, commandments. Tshuva is repentance, okay? That is the primary way Klai Yisrael does the tikkun or brings God back into the Bria. So what happened, therefore, is the zero now came that the third way of doing tikkun, right, is now going to be the major way, and that's Yisurin, suffering, which is exile, persecutions, it's everything, and so on. So the third way, which is the path of Yisurin, is suffering, that is the major way that Kaisal brings the Gula, and as a result of that, um, we therefore are in exile for 2,000 years, and so on. But what's important to know is that even though we are on this path of suffering, which is a third tikkun device, the tikkun is being done. Do not think it's not being done. So therefore, my shot in this is that in the first case, Rav Yitzchok, Bashmuel, he was shoyikari, because that was the initiation of that zero, which meant that what? That zero of, that we are now on the third path of tikkun, now ensues, and as a result, Rav Bosham has this incredible agony and anguish that he now has to resort to a third inferior way, which it really is, against his children to do the tikkun. So that's the expression of the initial agony. The, the, the second Gemara that says, Menahem is Kiyoyna, what happened? Because Kiyoyna is because once you do it, in the end, it still brings a tikkun, right? So therefore, the agony, although there's always an agony, but since it in, 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 and in its own way is doing the tikkun, suffering, so it's the only minahemes kiyoyna. You know, because the tikkun is being done. So that's why you have these two fundamental expressions. In any case, what we see is very important. We see that this is the initiation of zero. Of <coughs> that the way Klai Yisrael is now going to do the Tikkun, <coughs> the primary way used to be mitzvahs and tshuva, and then secondarily would be Yisurin, the suffering. Now the primary way is Yisurin, primary, and secondarily it's mitzvahs and tshuva. And that is caused for a tremendous amount of uh, suffering and anguish by the Shekhinah. So that's really what this Gemara is alluding to, is the change in the Anhogah of the Rebbe Hashem, the Klan That's what's really going on. Now, the question is, is when the, was that Zerah made? How does Yisurim bring it to the Tikkun? What's how does that method work? Yeah. I don't want to get into that. That's a whole... Uh, how does that method work itself? Yeah, it didn't change the name. It does change. He, he got his friend, and he's suffering. So, Jeff, I mean... When a person does a chet, okay, when a person does a chet, let me put it this way. What are the two essential um, uh, opponents? Who is the essential opponent of God? Adam, man, right? Why? Because man thinks he's a God. The Yisim Kelokim, the original temptation to Adam Rishon, is always with us. We want to be God. Many of us think we're God. <coughs> Some of us are. What? I was just saying. Some of us are. Some of us are God. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> you and I need to have a long talk after this year. <laughs> okay. In any case, <clears throat> the major opponent to God is man. What is the opponent? Number one, that man does not admit that God exists. B, that he is God, you see. So there are two ideas that everybody walks around with. One, that God, man, nah, he's not there really. You know, I don't see him. I don't see where he is or what he is. This world anyway is Hefka, right? It's Hefka anyway. And the second thing is, well, I am God. 
you see. So <clears throat> you need to remove both false ideas from a man. One, the first thing to remove is that, excuse me, you're not God. Then if you get rid of that, maybe there's a chance that you'll say, well, maybe there is God. You see? So that's a two-step process in reaching the truth. One is that you are not God. You're not who you think you are. And the second thing is that maybe there is a God. You see? Well, the first step of the process is that we are not God. Actually, in many ways, we have that, right? Our wives tell us we're not God. <laughs> That's why she's an Aza Kinegdoi. She's a Kinegdoi. She's always telling you, who do you think you are anyway? And so on, you know? But in a certain idea, you know, what tells us that we're not God? There's only two things. One is, like I said, your wife. And the second thing is called Tsaurus. <laughs> if you're God, how come you can't stop the Tsaurus? Hey, if you think who you are, how come you can't get rid of all the problems? And so on. So that itself destroys the illusion of invincibility and omnipotence. You ever see, you walk into a hospital and there are people lying in the ICU and all that place, right? Imagine there's a guy who's a multi-billionaire, you know, and he's lying in the ICU or the CCU, and he's plugged into, you know, 15 different things coming out of him, right? You walk over to him, and this guy, let's guy, this guy's worth five billion dollars, you know. If you look at that guy, he doesn't look like he has five billion dollars. He looks like he's <laughs> five cents. He's dead, as they say, you know. Well, why? Because it, the obvious the idea is that if you really think you're somebody, <coughs> why don't you just unplug everything and just walk out? So obviously he can't do that, or else he won't walk out, right? <laughs> So he comes to the realization that maybe I'm not who I think I am. So therefore what suffering does, it removes the first illusion that you think you're God. No, it does. It doesn't mean when the guy gets out of bed he's not going to go try to reassert himself because it's always a uh, design. We always want to think we're God. That's the, our problem. You know, what, you know, what our uh, psychology is, that's how we, uh, we, we defend ourselves. We compensate for our vulnerability and so on and so forth. We always need security and so on. Uh, but essentially, suffering is a lesson to a person. It diminishes his sense of omnipotence. It really does. I'm not saying it'll last, but it does. The Shas Maisa, so therefore Yisurin does say something. It allows a person to diminish half the illusion. The other half the illusion that there is a God and He runs the world, okay. That's why Yisurin is Mechaper. It's Mechaper because it does interact and it, uh, and it uh, damages the illusion of Enoid Mavadar, of Yeshayid Mavadar, that I'm also somebody. I don't care who it is. Anybody that suffers, and the more they suffer, the greater is the illusion broken. That's what it does. And therefore, you're halfway there. You're halfway there to, to a realization. Because what really interferes you from being oivet is that you think you're God. It's your will against His. But once you break that, then it's much easier and more likely that you can then become an oivet. That's why Yisurin as a Tikkun device is very important. It stops, puts a hold on the omnipotence of man, the illusion that he is God. So, Anyway, getting back to this. The question that you have to ask yourself is, when does this Xera happen, really? When did it happen, really? It's interesting. The Gemara brings it down twice. When was there a Xera of the switch in the way the Bosh Hashem is Manik Yisrael, or in the way the primary method of Tikkun by Klai Yisrael? That is the question. Got that question? That's obviously very critical. The answer to that is very interesting. There's a Hassam Soifa. Hassam Soifa says this in the, in the Terus Moshe and so on. He says that the zero for the destruction of the Beis Hamikdash happened on a Serabateves, a Serabateves. That's when the zero was promulgated, issued in Shemayim. That's an incredible statement. He's actually saying when. 
It was the xer of the destruction of the Rishamikdash didn't happen on Tisha B'Av. It doesn't happen in the Av. It happens on, it happened then on a Sorbetevis. That's when it's zero. Because the fact that Nebuchadnezzar can now take over Yerushalayim, that's the result of the zero. That we are given Bein Omos You see? So that's when the zero happened, which is an incredibly important concept. In fact, the Medrash Tanchuma says that really the Beis Hamikda should have been destroyed right then and there. Because that's the zero. Right? So the base of Migdash should have been destroyed right then and there. And certainly even in the year that the base of Migdash was destroyed, it should have been destroyed as Sorbetevis. But the Medrash says that the Russian had Machmonus on the Jews, so he decided that the, the destruction of the t- temple will happen in the summer. Because go kick somebody out of the house in the winter, uh, you see. So that's what the Medrash Tanchuma says. Now, the really should have happened at Sorbetevis. But it happened in the summer, when in the year that it was supposed to happen, because the fact that it happened was a warning, obviously. When Nebuchadnezzar took over Yishlaim, that was a warning. Okay, what's next? But in the year that it was supposed to happen, that's when it, uh, it, it, the Xera happened, the different Bosh had Rachmanus and did it in the summer. So the Hassam Sofer says the, xe, the initial Xera of the end, right? happened on a Serbet Davis. And what he says also is that every year we know there's Yushami that says that Kol Dor Shalei Nivne B'Yomov any generation which the Beis HaMikdash was not built in that day is Kilu Nechrov B'Yomov which means that in every year there's always a uh, what do you call it, a reinspection of the Xera. So if the Beis HaMikdash stood then the outcome would be that it has to be destroyed. If the base of Middash doesn't stand, then the outcome has to be that it won't be rebuilt. Same zero. And he says that that din Torah, so to speak, happens on a Serbet Tevis. That's an unbelievable Chiddush, which the Hassam Sofer says, and, and, and so on, which is incredible. What that does is it answers these two questions. First question is why do you have to fast on Friday it's the only one, Asur B'Tavis. It's unbelievable. And you come into Shabbos, famished, right? As we come into Shabbos, it's the bizarre of Shabbos. Yet we know that if Asur B'Tavis happens on Friday, you need to fast the whole day until it says, right? How is that possible? Because the Chorban isn't the destruction. It is the zero that's the Chorban. The destruction itself is merely the what's called the the natural outcome of the xera, but the real chorban of Klai Yisrael is the xera when it was issued in Shemayim, and it was issued on a Serbet Tevez, and that's the real chorban. And if that's the case, it's not so much when it was destroyed; it's when is the xera that it has to be destroyed, which is a Serbet Tevez. Therefore. If that's the case, that when it was issued, therefore, when it says what's the difference if it's Friday? And according to Avodrom, as I said, if the Asur Tevis fell on Shabbos, you'd have to fast on Shabbos. I said that in the beginning of this year, which is incredible. It doesn't because I said, because the Surah Rosh Chodesh Tevis can never come out on Thursday, and if Asur Tevis can never come out on Shabbos. But the Avodrom says, he's a Rishman, that if it did happen, you'd have to fast on Shabbos. Why? So the question was, nothing is destroyed on the Surah of Davis. So he, he took a siege of Jews from the Bukhadnezzar. And the answer is because what we're mourning isn't the siege, it's not the Chorban of the bias itself, it's the Gzer and Shemayim. That's the incredible tragedy. And therefore that Gzer is so horrendous, that it would require Klai Yisrael to fast even if it happened on Shabbos. And certainly Friday we have to fast. So it answers beautifully the Pneumius of Asur B'Tevez. Why you have to fast, A, eh? and why it is so great that even Friday. And it also answers the second question. What's the second question? Siege. The, uh, the second question is, it was a siege. It wasn't destroyed then. 
And the answer is because the destruction itself is merely the hech, is the toitzor of the gzera itself. Even on Tishabov, right? How in the world can it start even being burnt on the night of Vav when the actual destruction took place on the 10th? So make the first day the 10th. And the answer is no. The burning itself is the result, right? Is the result of what? Of the gzera. And the gzera of the ninth is the real hope. Because that allowed the Besamekdish to be stored on the tent itself. You see, that's why Chazal view the Aschola of the Chorban always greater than the Chorban itself. But even Tishabov, the Aschola of the Chorban, which was the ninth, which was the Xero of now it has to happen, isn't as great as Asura Batebis, which is a Xero of that it has to happen. You see, and that's the greatest of all Chorbanus of all. That's the premise of Asura Batebis, which is an amazing premise and so on. But it's an incredible Hassam Sofa that's Mahadish. That Xira happened in Shemayim. That's when you had the Dentura on Asura Batebis. And the second thing, right, is not just that Xira happened, but it happens every year. That, you know, the Gemara Yushami that says if it wasn't built on that day, it was as if it was destroyed on that day. When does that Dentura happen? And the answer is Asura Batebis. And it makes sense, you should know, because what is Tavis? Tavis is the month of Esau. Think about that. Tavis is the month of Esau. What's a sign of Tavis? Capricorn, the goat, a seer. That's his, the zodiac. That's its, uh, its, uh, its uh, what do you call it? Um, simon. It's mazel. A goat, a seer, is who? Is Edom. You see. So the truth is, Tavis is called the month of Edom. Uh, and in the month of Edo in Taka, what happened? The Xer was there, right? Because the Umus Oyim would be able to destroy the Beis HaMikdash. And that's why Hanukkah always precedes Teves. Because Hanukkah is really the Yontif of the Orishan, which is really Mashiach ben Yosef. So that always precedes earlier as a counter defense against the month of Esav, which is Teves. That's the very interesting concept. <coughs> now, we now understand what they're saying. Yeah, the the tiniest, the, the ikar of the tiniest is not the fasting; it's the the tshuva, the pishpus. Yeah, the Rambam writes that. Yeah. So, according to the Chassam Sefer, according to the second, the second part of his chiddush, which is that every year it happens, then we understand that if every year the clear happens again, then of yeah. course we have to we have to fast the tshuva any day of the week because. We don't want that zero to, to to take place again for this year. Yeah. So we can't have the tiniest nitre. It, it wouldn't. I mean, you have to do tshuva on the day of the, of judgment. Yeah, that's right. So it's like a keeper. Yes. It's the day of judgment. You that's why. Move, can, it. That's why it supersedes uh, Shabbos. Right. Yeah, that's the only reason why. <coughs> see, that and it's a very important concept of what a sorbetavus is. It's a very important, you know. That our server table is the zero itself, <coughs> which is decreed. Will the base of Megiddo be destroyed if it's standing, or it will never be rebuilt if it's not standing? That's what our server table is, and that's why the halacha is that even though it's Friday, you still have to fast. And the halacha is even if it was Shabbos on the Avud Rome, you'd have to fast. And that's why even though it occurred several years before. The Chorb bias, which is the Tishabov, but that Chorb bias happened when, years later, right? But that was nothing more than a logical outcome of the original Xera, which happened in Arasur Batavis. Now, it's also interesting, which I have to add, which is Kedai, that not only is Arasur Batavis bad news, but so is the 8th and the 9th of Tevis. Why? And you'll notice that they're all part of Xera. Because they all come in the month of Teves, which is the month of Edom. Okay? What happened on the 8th of Teves? Uh, Ptolemy, the second of Egypt, decreed he wanted to have a translation of the Torah, the Bible. So he got 72 guys, Chazal, put them all in these separate rooms, uh, and lo and behold, they all translated the Torah into Greek, which is a Septuagint. Okay? And it was Nisim with that. <coughs> Because they all translated word for word exactly. It didn't deviate, which was itself a nest, because uh, whoever heard of translators 
coming up with the exact wording. The only way that happens is if it's plagiarized. But since each one was separate, 72 different rooms, that obviously was an impossibility. <coughs> and so on. So that was a moedic ness. But that zero happened on the eighth day of Tevez. Now, what does it have to do with the original zero of Asar of Tevez? Because think about it. <coughs> Once it was translated to Greek, Greek was the language spoken, right? <coughs> if that's the case, that means Goyim now had access to the Torah. So what's the problem? Because when a Goyim has access to the Torah, <coughs> more often than not, they are going to falsify, distort, and corrupt the meaning to fit with their own desires to be over the the Zora and have a support from the Torah itself, which is exactly what they did. I mean, the most famous of all cases where they took out Torah, right, and they falsified, distorted, corrupted, is the New Testament. But what they did is the King James Version. I mean, if you ever take a look at it, not that I'm recommending it, uh, and so on, you can't believe they have distorted, unbelievable, you know, uh, they, 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 they mistranslated words on purpose, they invented sukkim that don't even exist in the Torah, you know, <clears throat> and they have all kinds of references to their guy, Yeshu, from the Torah itself, which is unbelievable. So therefore, uh, that's what, what should have happened, that's what did happen. And that's why the translation of the Torah in the uh, Greeks by Ptolemy II was a terrible disaster for Clydesville. Because the corruption, the falsification of the Torah itself, they use it as support <laughs> for their belief system. <coughs> and like I say, the greatest case of that is the Christianity. Forget about the New Testament. It's what they did to the Torah itself. Uh, they use it to support their own belief system and so on. So that happened also, that happened on the 8th. And ask yourself, when the Barsham was Nigza, Goze, that the Jews have to go and bain Umas Oilam, what was he Goze? It was just, wasn't just against the Jews, right? It was also against the Torah itself. That the Gzir also is that the Torah itself has to go in Golis. So as long as the Torah is written in Hebrew, how? But once the Torah is written in a form where everybody, any, anybody can understand it, that's the Golis Atura. That anybody has access to the Torah to falsify, distort, and corrupt the Torah. So the Gzir was, and that's why it happened on the 8th of Tevis, which again is in the month of Edoi, Esau, right? And you know, the 8th of Tevis, which is, uh, you know, whatever. That's what it happened. Now, the 9th of Tevis is also very bad for Clydesville. Why? Um, because of several fundamental ideas. First of all, Ezra HaSofa died. So we show him say, Ezra HaSofa died. And that, the one that indicates two really bad stuff. One, because Ezra HaSofa himself was Mashiach ben Yosef. And that's what it says. Roy Shittinos and Torah to Ezra. What does that mean? Uh, that means had Moshe Rabbeinu not given the Torah, so a good substitute would have been Ezra. But that's incredible. How is that possible? And the answer is because Moshe Rabbeinu is Mashiach ben Yosef. That's really who he was. And he gives the Chochmah of the Torah. And that's exactly what he did. But Ezra Sofa also was Mashiach ben Yosef. And had it not been for the fact that all the Jews didn't come back with him, only about 70,000 Jews came back with him from Bovel, Babylon, to build the base of Mikdush, uh, then Ezra Sefer HaKoyin, actually he was a Koyin, which is interesting, he would have been Sheikh ben Yosef. So when he dies, that's the end of the ability, obviously, of him to be Sheikh ben Yosef. That is the termination of the possibility uh, that Christ will have been Sheikh ben Yosef and the Gula, the redemption, to Ezra Sefer, <coughs> which is really amazing and so on. The second thing is that the prophecy ended with Ezra Sefer. Uh, Nevoah ended with him, and you remember what I said? That's the Richo, where the Baal Shem destroyed his Heichel, he burnt his Heichel, that's the end of prophecy, <clears throat> and Ezra Sefer died on the ninth of, uh, the ninth of, of Tebes. A, 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 another thing that happened on the ninth of Tebes, uh, which this Rabbi Avram Bachia, who lived in the 12th century, he says the following, which is very interesting, he says that Yeshu was born the real birthday of Yeshu was the ninth of Tevez. 
which may, which it's interesting because Night of Tavis falls out January 1st. According to them, he was born December 25th, and January 1st is his bris. Right? It's eight days later. That's according to them. The uh, the uh, Greek the Greek Orthodox Church doesn't believe it happened December 25th because that's obviously a Roman holiday called Saturnalia <coughs> to celebrate the uh, solstice. No, the winter year, the winter, uh, the uh, uh, yeah, not the equinox, the solstice means that's the winter begins, which is the shortest night, shortest night, the longest night. But uh, they hold it sometime in January. I don't recall the exact date, which uh, and so on. But he says that uh, the ninth day of Teves is the birth of that guy, of Yeshu, which is amazing. You think about that, which makes all the sense because that's the Umas Ha'ilam. Uh, the Xero, a whole kind that came way after the, uh, well, actually came before. But the Xero to, to, to allow Kleistro to be in the hands of the Goyim, obviously the greatest, uh, the greatest um, uh, Klippa, or the greatest Golos is Christianity. Uh, and he was also born almost the day before. And there are, there are certain points combined, by the way, that hold that you have to fast three days. The 8th, the 9th, and the 10th. It's a great way to start a diet, by the way. That's if you can survive for all three days. Um, but in any case, and they are persecuted because they hold that these three days are one of the darkest periods of Kleinist world. You see. Again, because of these. And all of them illustrate one idea. It's the change of Anhoga of the Rabbanishlam. That the Tikkun of the Bria will no longer be primarily through mitzvahs and tshuva, right? Commandments and uh, repentance. It will be through suffering, which is the third Tikkun device third device of uh, rectification of the Bri and so on. Uh, and that's essentially really what happened. So, we've gone through the concept of a Serbatavis, which is I think a whole different way now of understanding of what a Serbatavis is. What's also beautiful about that, it tells us exactly, uh, not only that there was a Xera, which we see from the Gemara, when the Xera happened. And it beautifully answers why we have to fast on Friday. That's how Chosh, because that's the greatest the great, the real, the, the worst day of Klein's world is when the version had that zero. Uh, so it tells us that. And that's why you have to fast Friday and Conte have a drum even if it came out on Shabbos, which it doesn't, and so on. And the second thing is why something which occurred several years before the destruction of the Bishamigdash, why should we fast? And the answer is because that was the zero, Conte Hassam Sefer, on that day. And every year, the zero not to rebuild the Bishamigdash also happens on that day and therefore even though it happens far before it is the real it is the real of uh, zero the decree and whatever happens after that is nothing more than the repercussions the outcome of this zero itself in any case this is the concept of a Serbatavis which is this Thursday January 1st uh, so obviously it's a very Choshev and so on uh, and um, this is what it has to do with all the Hashkofa and so on. Any um, questions? Oh, by the way, so next week we're not having a shir because I'm leaving for Eretz Yisrael, so until I come back after Purim, uh, then we'll resume the shir, you know? Tomorrow? What was that? Tomorrow yes, well, yeah. Tomorrow night again, we'll have the shir Sunday night, 8 o'clock. Then that will also be the last year for this Kufa. Okay? Thank you.